Hi everyone, this is just a quick video taking you through some of the key aspects of the functional skills qualification for English. So what we're looking at specifically is the spelling, punctuation and grammar. Now even if you aren't studying functional skills, if you're studying the GCC element of English as well, then this will still be beneficial to you because spelling, grammar and punctuation is such a really important part of English. So what we're going to focus on now is improving the technical accuracy of our writing. So why is spelling, punctuation and grammar so important? A spelling, punctuation and grammar is important because the knowledge of spelling, punctuation and grammar will help you to properly arrange words in a sentence and add the correct punctuation. This will allow you to communicate effectively with others in the short term the ability to spell, punctuate and produce grammatically correct sentences in assessments is really important. So this is often an area that gets neglected, especially when it comes to the big writing tasks. So if you're doing your writing assessment for either functional skills level one, level two, ESOL, or even the GCSE specification as well, this is a really important aspect that you need to be going over and revising. So what I'd like to think about then just before we move on, to try and stretch and challenge yourself and consider how could your spelling, punctuation and grammar how could it actually impact or affect your opportunities for getting a job? Now what we're going to do is we're going to move on and we're going to have a look at an actual letter of intent that someone has wrote to an employer asking to actually be considered for a position. Okay, So when we look at the example, I want you to try and think about what mistakes have been made, what kind of things do we need to improve in order to make sure this person is able to get a job and actually have a positive impact on a potential employer. So if we have a look at it now then, a really important thing to do when you are writing your own response is to think about reading it out loud because that really helps to understand where the punctuation needs to be. So as I read it now, we're going to think what mistakes have been made and how could we improve this response. So it says, all right, mate, I'm writing this to inquire about a job vacancy I've heard you've got. I'm a really hard worker and I know that given the opportunity, I'd be a great member of your team. My mate Jason works at your place already and he says that if you work hard, then you can get promoted really quickly. I'm a hard worker and I think you would be mad not to take me on for the job you have available. Now, what's important to note with this example is this isn't one that I've just came up with by myself. It is a real um, expression of intent that someone's given to a future employer. As you can see there, as I read it through, um, the punctuation is kind of lacking and you could tell there because I was kind of getting short on my breath. I had to force a little bit of a pause there. Now, punctuation is very important because it allows the reader to understand where the pauses need to be and allows them to take a breath and also helps the flow of the writing as well. So all I'd like you to do is have a look at it and see what kind of mistakes are visible in this response. And if we just have a look now, you could probably see that it's using words like mate, it's using words like writing, which is spelt with an R instead of a W. And these are some very kind of common mistakes that we should be picking up on and definitely shouldn't be including if you're writing a letter or an expression of interest to an employer. Now, what I'd like you to do is think about what we've just read and try and identify the true or the false statements about the extract. So the first one, then, the response has used colloquial language, which makes it seem unprofessional. If you're not too sure what we mean about when we talk about colloquial language, please do check out our other videos which go on to that in a little bit more detail. But essentially we're talking about informal language, which will go into more detail as well. There are only three spelling mistakes in the writing. Now, if this video went a little bit too quickly, and you're not too sure how many spelling mistakes are actually in the example, please do feel free to go back and just double check. So what do you think then? Are there only three spelling mistakes in the writing or could there possibly be more mistakes? The lack of punctuation makes the writing seem rushed and frantic. And final one, many of the mistakes that are made are due to the writer confusing homophones. And if you're not too sure what we mean by homophones, we're going to go through that in a bit more detail on the next part of the video. Class feedback. Check your answers against the ones below. So now what we're going to do, we're going to have a look at the same response that we looked at a moment ago. So the example there is on the left hand side. And we're going to have a little bit of understanding about the correct answers from the statements that we were looking at. 
So then, the first one was, the response has used colloquial language, which makes it seem unprofessional. And this, of course, is true. Now, colloquial language is something that you can use in certain settings and for certain audiences. However, if you're writing to a future employer or someone in a more formal setting, you want to make sure that your tone reflects that, so you shouldn't be using colloquial language. Next one. There are only three spelling mistakes in the writing. This is false. There are actually many spelling mistakes in this response. Now, it might be that you're able to get away with one or two misspelled words, especially if they're quite big words or quite difficult words. But if you're spelling anything wrong, like anything that is quite common spellings, like the there, there or there, anything that's kind of quite low um, skilled words as well, will definitely have a negative effect on how the audience is interpreting you as a person. Even if this is a job that doesn't require you to do a lot of admin work, it still is not creating a good impression for the employer. Third one then, the lack of punctuation makes the writing seem rushed and frantic. So you can see there from that response, it's only used one full stop. And this is making it seem really, really rushed and frantic. Yes, it's used one comma there in the first line. But other than that, it's really going to force us to read it in a very fast, rushed way which is going to make it seem as though it's just something you've scribbled down and not something that you've put a lot of thought and effort into. Last one. Many of the mistakes are due to the writer confusing homophones. Okay, and that is true. If you're not too sure what we mean by homophones, we're going to look at those in a bit more detail in the next part of the video. Learning recap. Can you remember what all of these terms mean? So now what we're going to do, we're going to look at a few key terms. We have looked at them in other videos as well. So you might have heard of these before, but it's really important that you go back and you review and you reflect on the things that you've learned while watching some of these videos. So the first one, this was seen in the actual example that we just went through, is colloquial language. Now that is really the posh word for essentially saying slang. So this is the kind of language that we use in more informal settings. Now, I'm not saying that you should never use colloquial language. It's actually really, really important when you're actually creating a relationship with the audience. So it really depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to young people, for example, then it's probably best that you don't speak in you know, very sophisticated language, words that they might find difficult and hard to understand. You talk to them on the same level that they would be able to perceive the information that you're trying to convey. It's also important to use colloquial language if you're writing to a friend or a relative. You don't need to put on additional airs and graces, and this helps to kind of get the audience aware that this is a relationship, okay? And when we are uh, having relationships with people, we feel a closeness, we feel a bond, and therefore you're more likely to listen to what they have to say and be convinced by their argument. Homophones. Homophones are a really good thing to know. If we actually break down this word homophones, the first bit, homo, means the same, and phones is referring to sound, so things that we can hear. So the technical definition then is these are two or more words that have the same pronunciation but different meanings, origins, or spellings. For example, we have the word new and new. Now these sound exactly the same, but the meaning behind them are very, very different. When we say that something is new in terms of N-E-W, we mean that it is something that has just been made or created or something like that, whereas new implies a knowledge of something. Okay, so very similar words, but different interpretations as well. So what I'd like you to do, if you're still a little bit unsure about these terms, or if you'd like to look them at them in a bit more detail, then view some of our other videos to help build and develop your understanding of these. We do have a full video on homophones and also homonyms as well. So you can look at these kind of words, and if you're someone who's, let's say, an ESOL learner, this will be really vital and important to help uh, improve not only your writing ability, but also your speaking and listening as well. So, formal and informal writing. When can you use them? So when we say informal writing, we, we mean using things like our colloquial language, our slang, and formal is the more, should we say, posh or sophisticated words you might use in your response. So first of all then, for formal writing. This is used when writing in a serious or professional manner. Often you'll use formal writing for things like letters, emails, reports, articles and speeches. Now you might find that when we go and have a look at the informal writing as well, that 
there's going to be several different forms of writing that are repeated, both for formal and informal. And the thing I'd say to pay attention with this is to really understand who is it you're writing to? Who is the audience? And that will dictate whether you use formal or informal writing. So informal language then. Informal or colloquial language is used when communicating with someone you already have a relationship with. Often you will use these four things like a blog, a personal letter, an email to a friend or a peer. And when we say a peer, we mean someone that's on a similar level to you. So it might be someone that you work with, someone that you're currently studying with as well. A speech, an internet forum, and also an article. But again, that really does depend on the audience. So it's really important that you consider that as well. Again, just the teacher's top tip there right at the top. Remember, language you use is dependent on the audience you're addressing in your writing. So when you do approach your actual question, make sure that you're thinking about the TAP, the topic, the audience and the purpose. And you have a very clear understanding of who the audience is, because this will really, really impact the kind of language we're using in our writing. What are homophones? So simply put, homophones are words that have the same sound but a different meaning. Using the wrong homophone can lose your marks when attempting your writing question, so it's really important that you're aware of which words are homophones and which ones are the right ones to use depending on the context that you want to use them in. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try and test your understanding of homophones by having a look at a few different sentences on the next part of the video just to test your understanding of which ones are homophones and what situation to use them in effectively. Look at the sentences below and identify where the wrong homophone has been used. So the first one then. Their house is closer to the town centre than mine. Number two. I support Liverpool Football Club, which is near to where I grew up. Number three. The charity was happy to accept our donation. Number four. Too much chocolate is bad for children. It can make their stomachs ache. Number five. Jamie completed all of his homework, so he was allowed to go and play football. Now, if you'd like to pause the video here and go through these in your own time, please feel free to do so. What I'm going to do now is just go ahead and look at the answers in the next part of the video. Class feedback. Check your answers against the ones below. So number one. Their house is close to the town centre. Now there is a really tricky kind of homophone because there are technically three types of there that you can use. Now this there, spelled T-H-E-I-R, has been, has been used to show a possession of something. So when we say their house, it means the house that they own or the house that they live in. It's a possession. Number two, I support Liverpool Football Club, which is near to where I grew up. So the first example that we saw on the previous part of the video also said which, but it meant which in terms of the kind that rides on a broomstick you normally associate with Halloween. Number three, the charity was happy to accept our donation. So there's actually two mistakes in that one. The first one is actually a really tricky one that even native speakers of English struggle with from time to time. So instead of accept, it's accept. So the first one that we looked at in the previous part of the video Except is kind of used when you say we're all going to town except for you. It's kind of used to exclude a certain person or a group of people. Accept means that you are taking something. You've been given something and you receive it. OK, so they're accepting a donation. It means they've taken a donation off the speaker in the sentence. And the other one is our donation. Now this is one that can be quite tricky, especially when you're actually thinking about how we pronounce these words in our normal day-to-day -day conversations. Our and A-R-E actually sounds very, very similar from the ways that people actually pronounce them, but it should be O-U-R, so our donation. Number four, too much chocolate is bad for children. It can make their stomachs ache. So the first one is two. Now very similar to there, this is another homophone where we actually have three examples. This two is the one that we're referring to when you're talking about a quantity. So the idea in this sentence is that the children have had 
you know, quite a lot of chocolate, too much in fact, and that is going to be T double O. It can make their stomachs ache. So there has been used because it's a possession, it's their stomachs, they own them, they're in possession of their stomachs, so therefore it's the correct there to use in that sentence. And number five, last one. Jamie has completed all of his homework, so he was allowed to go and play football. So you can see there, there's quite a big difference between the allowed we saw on the previous part of the video to the one we've got now. Allowed means that he was given permission to go and play football, whereas the other example was kind of like if you were to read something aloud. So it has a different meaning behind each word. Look at the writing task and make helps to make you plan your response. So really good ones are practice now. We're going to have a look at a scenario based around a similar thing that we looked at the previous part of the video. So here's our information. You're applying for an internship at your dream job. You're excited and eager to make a good impression. Write a letter to express your interest for the role. Remember to write in formal language and state clearly why you should be selected for this opportunity. So this is a really good thing to get practice for because it might not necessarily be something you need in your exam, but it is something you'll be doing later on in life when you're applying for jobs and different opportunities. When we look at the actual writing task then, it says your dream job could include. So the examiner is actually being really helpful here by giving us a few things we could focus on. So working for your favourite football team and helping out the players. A position within your favourite gaming company. A position that allows you to help other people and have a rewarding experience or anything else you can think of. Again, these aren't things that you have to include. It's just giving you some ideas because it can be a little bit difficult to come up with them on the spot. In your response, you should express yourself clearly and concisely. So clearly means that you're talking about exactly what you need to be talking about and you're not rambling on about things that have nothing to do with the topic and concisely means that you're not writing page after page after page. This is quite a small task. Typically, when we're talking about your functional skills exam, it's not going to be worth any more than 21 marks. So you shouldn't be writing four or five pages in your response. So keep it clear and keep it nice and to the point. Use a range of persuasive techniques. And again, the main ones that we're going to be focusing on are under forest techniques. If you're not too sure what we mean by these, do check out our other videos that go into those in more detail. Use homophones appropriately. So double check, read your writing. Have you used the right there, there and there? Because if not, it's a real easy way to lose yourself some marks in the actual assessment. Write with formal language. Because this is actually about a dream job, we're going to be writing to a potential employer. So you're not going to use colloquial language because that is not going to get the right tone or the right atmosphere for your writing. And it's going to force the reader of um, your writing to maybe make some judgments and potentially think critically about you before they've even met you in the first place. Check your spelling, punctuation and grammar. This is something that's often neglected, not just with people with functional skills, but also at GCSE as well. I can't stress enough how important it is that you go back through and you double check those elements as well. If you're struggling to start, you can use the response on the next slide to help you. Um, very rarely is it that we produce something that's perfect the first time. OK, so it's important that you come back, you review and you just see if you can make slight improvements over the time. Use the example below to help write your own response. So it says then, Dear Sir slash Madam, I'd like to be considered for the internship available at Ubisoft. I am passionate, driven and determined to pursue a career in games design. I love games and want to take the next step to help others get the same enjoyment that I've experienced since I was young. There are many reasons why I'd be the best candidate for the job. There is no task too big or too small I know in my heart that this is the position for me. So if we think back to the first example that we saw, the first example was very informal. It used a lot of colloquial language. The spelling, the grammar wasn't particularly effective there as well. And we can see that this example has used a much more professional and appropriate tone in order to get at the position. So if you want to have a go at doing your own response, it's really important that you um, keep going back to it on your work, you're reviewing it, you're reflecting, and you're seeing how you can improve it and just make it a little bit better each and every time. 
And if you want to use any of the ideas that you can see in this video, please feel free to do so. It all helps just to improve and to practice your writing skills. Reviewing your work. Remember that when you're finished with your writing task, it's very important that you go back over and you check your spelling, your punctuation and your grammar. If you look on the left hand side, we have what is called a punctuation pyramid. Now, this is a really useful thing to do to help assess how well you're using punctuation in your writing. You can see there that it starts off with the very simple forms of punctuation. You've got things like a full stop, a question mark, a comma, an exclamation mark in the first three rows. Now, that is absolutely fine to use if you're doing, let's say, level one functional skills. But if you want to go a little bit higher, make sure you're definitely going to get a pass, progress onto level two or even GCSE English. Then you need to be going down further down in the pyramid. Once you've written your response, what I'd like you to do is to consider how far down the pyramid can your response actually get? Have you used some of these forms of punctuation or do you need to go back, look over your work and see where you can improve your response? Then I want you to have a go at the super challenge, try and upgrade your response by using more advanced forms of punctuation. Again, the more you practice this, the more you get into the habit of using these advanced forms of punctuation, the easier it will be when you come and actually approach a real life assessment. If you need any additional support or help, the new videos will be added every single week. Alternatively, please feel free to leave us a comment, like and subscribe, or if you can't find anything on our channel, please visit our partner channel, Bookworm Teaching, for more lessons and guidance on all things English. Thanks ever so much for listening, guys, and if you need anything, please feel free to leave a comment. Bye.